This is Hog Farmer Chris from the Hog Farmers Charitable Foundation. And before you start listening to Red Zone in the Lab, check out our Amazon Smile, a simple way to support the Hog Farmers Charitable Foundation every time you shop, and it's no cost to you. We're back! Welcome back to Red Zone in the Lab with Deuce. <laughs> Welcome to a brand new season of the Red Zone in the Lab podcast, where nothing is off the table. We will be discussing entrepreneurship, education, black history, health, movies, family, and of course, sports. So do yourself a favor. Make sure you like, subscribe, and follow on all social media platforms, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And of course, you can always visit us at redzoneinthelab.com. Welcome, welcome back to Red Zone in the Lab podcast. I am Deuce, and entering the lab today is Sam Fortier from the Washington Post. Sam, how are you? Happy holidays. It's been a little while since we talked. Um, how you been, buddy? Uh, I've been doing well, man. Thank you for having me, as always. I appreciate it. Sam, the season is over. Um, it didn't go how I expected it. Did it go how you expected it? Well, I mean, if you'd asked me before the year, what was their win total going to be? I would have said between seven and nine, seven and ten games, maybe generously, because I thought at the beginning of the year, Carson Wentz, the addition was was going to elevate the offense. Obviously, that did not happen, <laughs> um, but they still ended up between seven and nine wins, <laughs> even, you know, even though they finished 500 in a 17 game season. So uh it certainly was not how i expected i am not claiming credit or saying i'm swami or anything but they did end up roughly where i think we expected yeah um and we just got some news from nikki and of course i was kind of looking at your page um how concerning is that to lose so many high-ranking officials within the last few years yeah the business staff under jason wright the team president uh since he took over you know there's certainly been an exodus of of high-ranking officials there uh you could argue you know maybe it's you know the snyders they've been the consistent one maybe it's right maybe it's now because you know if you're changing ownership maybe business executives want to jump before you know somebody new comes in and, and cleans house uh some i'm sure are just personal situations um you know, Dave Baldwin, the chief ticketing officer who left for an MLS franchise is from the Midwest. So that could have been a, a part of his situation. So uh, obviously, when you come into a situation and you clean house, when you're Jason Wright, when you're proud of, hey, we're remaking this organization's culture to then have so many high ranking officials leave in, in such a high, uh, such a rapid succession, I think is always going to be concerning. Uh, but obviously, you know, that's a highly contextual situation. Yeah, to me, it, it seems very concerning to have so many high rank and then knowing everything that we're going through. And, you know, a lot of times we hear people say, you know, it's better now since Jason has been in there. But a lot of people is leaving. For me, that can be very concerning, especially with everything that's going on with the franchise and the sale and different things like that. Um, so what does the Fanatic Sportsbook do for the commanders and how was it? You were there. You seen it um is it is it one of those you know sean taylor type things and is it a did, did they actually hit on this that's what i want to know did they hit on this you know i so i used to live actually down by the cap one sports book um at cap okay. one arena where the whiz and the, and the caps play and uh I, I thought it was you know it's a pretty similar vibe the cap one you know book is bigger um but when i was touring around you know they got some betting stations obviously they got you know, chairs, tabletops, a bar. Uh, they got Sean Taylor, Sonny Jurgensen, and Daryl Green jerseys behind the bar. Um, I mean, it's pretty much, you know, if you've been to a, a sports lounge, if, if, if you've been to a sports bar lounge, it's pretty much that vibe just with some some betting machines. Um, you know, it, it's nice in there. Uh, it's interesting because this is Fanatics' first foray into gambling they don't have an app yet uh this is their first brick and mortar location i don't know how much it does for the franchise honestly i mean they say that they have big expectations for foot traffic in there but i mean you've been to landover like there's not a ton around that stadium yeah. um and i know that's been you know some complaints of the community itself um so i'd be curious to know like you know for the for the games this weekend for example like how many people are going to go over there 
um, and order food and, and, and do the whole thing. When I tweeted out the, uh, the menu, I know people – <laughs> really, I think they first saw the twelve dollar <laughs> mozzarella sticks, and they were like, what, "What's up with that?" But uh, you know, that's neither here nor there for me. I'm just curious what kind of foot traffic they're going to get. Yeah, because it's, it's very barren for the lack of words over um, in that area, and outside of actually having events there, there's really no reason to go up to the to, to that stadium. So, um, hopefully, having that, it, it'll bring people in. But I'm just not optimistic that it, it's going to do that, um, Sam. So. Um, uh, for you, when it comes to the the sale of the team, um, do you think this has any impact? Because I know Dan has been working on this for a while, and um, he wasn't there. I know that's a that's a probably a thorn in his side, also. But do you you think that this has anything to do to help or it have any any type of impact on, on on the sale? You mean the sports book? Yes. I, I, I can't imagine so. Maybe like their their sports betting license in the state of Maryland or their fan dual partnership in Virginia with mobile. I think some of those things when you talk about the value of the franchise could could incrementally help a little bit. But you know, if you're Todd Boley, if you're Jeff Bezos, if you're Josh Harris, some of these prospective owners, I, I don't see a seven billion you know, seven ish billion dollar transaction being affected by, by licenses. Cause if, if you don't have it, they could come in there and be like, you know, that we're going to get that. Or right. you know, if you put a stadium back at RFK, we could get a license in the district or, or something like that. You know, so I, I don't see the sports book as having any impact on, on the sale process. Yeah. Um, let's get to a little bit of football. Um, the exit interviews. I just, I kind of, I'm kind of curious of how the, exit interviews that you all have with the team when you all are, are, in, uh, are in the locker room with them. What was the vibe like um, in the locker room doing exit interviews? And does anything kind of stand out to you during, those, during that process? Well, I mean, I think the disappointment um, and a lot of players saying, you know, we really felt like, especially during that middle of the year, we made a run again for the second year in a row. Like we really felt like we had something yeah. there and to fall short, I think really frustrated a lot of guys and, you know, some, there were, there were a lot of, I think factors to falling short, Charles Leno, uh, the left tackle, you know, kind of said, Hey, like I wasn't my best this year. I, I'm mad at myself and I know that I need to improve. Um, you know, before that season finale in Dallas, uh, I reported a story. I talked to 11 players total who either on the record or on background expressed frustration with the play calling, of Scott Turner, particularly in that second Giants game on Sunday Night Football. I think that there was some frustration with the offense. Logan Thomas, you know, told reporters, he was like, look, like we have too much talent to be not scoring enough points. You know, we, we scored 12 points against Cleveland. We scored, you know, 10 points. So um, for the amount that they invested in that offense, even if Carson Wentz didn't work out, still feel like you got to put up more points. And obviously, you know, Scott Turner gets fired a couple days later. So um, I think the vibe – was frustration. Obviously we saw a couple guys that were injured. We hadn't seen in a while. Uh, Antonio Gibson um, was in there on crutches. Cole Holcomb was in there wheeling around. Um, he, he had surgery. Um, JD was there too, right? JD was there. And, and, you know, for him, man, like I think the future is, is, is very tough, delicate right? for him. Yeah. yeah. Like when you have two neck injuries in a row, pretty serious ones. Um, Ron Rivera said he's going to have to talk to his doctors and like make a choice about his personal health. I, I don't even think we're talking about like, what can this dude bring, uh, you know, bring to this football team next year. I think it's, it's, it's what's his hits of life looking like moving forward. Yeah. That's very scary to have those neck injuries and especially everything that we went through um, recently. You, you just, you, you don't want to take those chances. Um, yeah. So do you think like a lot of people saying Ron was bullied in a sense uh, the first time to, to, to go with Sam Howe, um, fully before the last game and also for this 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 last the, the firing of Scott Turner it seemed like you know a lot of things begin to leak um coming out how the, the like like you were saying the players showing the the frustrations with um Scott Turner D do you think that Ron would have would have made that move uh even without those frustrations been, been being leaked out because that was kind of odd coming from this Ron Coast team to have those many leaks I don't know if Ron 
was was bullied into it necessarily. I think the number one thing in terms of starting Sam Howell was his conversation that he had on Wednesday morning with Taylor Heineke yeah. and Taylor Heineke saying, you know, you know, play the kid basically. Um, and, and him saying, you know, I, I think if you're Taylor Heineke and you're, and, and your coach just said, Hey, we wanted a spark. So we went with the other guy <laughs> and then he wants to go back to you against a really talented defensive yeah. front when oh, you're about to hit yeah. free agency and you can cash in, like, I'm good. Thanks. Yes. Like, you play, play. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that was bullied. And, and, you know, I have a hard time imagining whether it leaks or not. Like, Ron's going to have those exit interviews with his starting offensive players. And when he says, like, what do you think of the coaching this year? And if they all were genuine with him and if they all expressed to him what they expressed to me as a coach, I, I don't know how you can stick by your OC, um, especially when you invested – um, all that you have in, into creating, you know, the skill players. So in, in collecting those skill players. So I, I think that Ron, you know, he always says I have fiduciary responsibility to do what's best for this team. And I think that he was in, in both cases uh, doing those things. Uh, when it comes to um, Jack Del Rio, and it's very hard to find contract information uh, for him online. Like for some reason, it's very difficult, but that's, um, I that's do, all coaches. No, yeah. like, Ron, I mean, Ron, you know, there are, coaching data is not available on over the cap, you know, in the way that like players are, um, which is which if, if you said, hey, that's kind of messed up. I would agree. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's, no, there's no transparency there. Right. But but we do know he had a, a three year deal, though. Right. Like the same as Turner. But we know Turner was extended last year. Do you have any information on, on what's the status of his contract? I, I, I do not. Uh, I, I mean, like my sense is that. Uh, his deal is is not up. Uh, that he'll be well. Let me put it this way: there is no sense that he will not be back as the defensive yeah. coordinator of the team next year. I don't know the status of his contract um, currently, but all signs point to him returning. All right. So they were supposed to have this budget meeting on last Monday um, that Ron had kind of mentioned uh, the previous week. It didn't happen. It was rescheduled. And I believe a report came off from Ben Stanick, Stanick that they did have. Um, the meter later that week. Do you have any information about the meeting? And if not, what do you think those conversations w- were about? Yeah, so I obviously wasn't there, um, but the meeting did happen. And my sense is that, you know, the status quo is still the same. You know, Jay, we, we met with Jason Wright at the sports book. He said on the business side, like on the football side, nothing changes. Everything is still the same despite the ongoing sale. Ron Rivera said that at his end of season presser with Martin Mayhew show goes on, nothing is interrupted. If those guys are right, if that is actually true, obviously that is a big win for the franchise and they can go about, you know, building things the way that they see fit. Um, But I am not 100% convinced that that is true. And I mean, we'll see in free agency, we'll see by what they do. I'm not saying they have to make a splash move to, to prove that they can spend money. But I do think that we will see if they have another very inactive free agency like they did last year. I think that people are going to say, Hey, you know, like what's holding this up. Cause obviously you have needs you got to fill. And I've been hearing a lot about uh, uh, them being cash poor. It, like w- w- what does that really mean to be cash poor? I guess like I would ask like, in what context have you heard that? Like it, they'll say they're not able to spend money, let's say for signing bonuses and, and things like that. Um, they were kind of hindered from doing that the past year, more so last free agency. Yeah, so that's not something that uh, that we have reported. Uh, I think that I've you know probably heard in, in the same context that you have, um, but that that's not something that uh, you know Ron has has spoken on or that that you know we've that 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 has you know conclusively come out. Um, I think that you always got to ask questions, especially when. Uh, you know, the team in, in 2021, right? Like they pay Will Jack a lot of money. Um, yeah, they did. They, they pay Curtis Samuel. Curtis Samuel. Uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick. And then, you know, they, they trade for Carson Wentz, so they assume a big cap hit, but that's not necessarily a lot of cash outlay mm-hmm. in the same way. So, I mean, it's a totally fair question. Um, but, you know, uh, there's no – I don't have any insight. Concrete, for yeah. Um, before I let you go, um, um, Sam, offensive coordinators, I think we're up around five, I think, that we've – interview any any one of those particular guys that um uh for you that you would like for them uh to hire 
yeah, so Thomas Brown, the the Rams, you know, assistant head coach slash tight ends coach, uh, was interviewed today, Tuesday, and he's the he's the fifth one, like you said. I think that there are a couple different lanes for Ron Rivera here. He he can stick with a similar sort of offensive scheme, you know, help Sam Howell. Um, that would be real, you know, Ken Zampezi, the quarterbacks coach here now. That would be the the simplest transition for Howell. But I don't know if you really feel great about the ceiling. Uh, of, of that offense, particularly uh, when you look at Zampezi's track record um, as an OC. But, I mean, man, like, I think that there is an argument for kind of totally going in a different direction because Ron Rivera has tried things and people that he knows over and over, yeah, and it's led hurt. to seven <laughs> wins, seven wins, eight wins, you know? Yeah. Like, if you said, hey – let's go West coast offense or let's go, you know, some other scheme other than like an air Coriel based vertical attack, like, like Scott Turner was trying to hit. I don't know that. Um, I don't know that that's a bad idea to totally, you know, take a departure. So I think <sighs> Eric Studisville, uh has, has, you know, a lot of good, uh, you know, references, uh, you know, Nikki covered him um, when he was in Denver and, and, um, you know, she said that, that people really liked him. I think, uh, Charles London, Thomas Brown, some of these guys, like, like they are, I'm not super inspired by, by any of these choices. And I get that like the ownership situation and, and the coaching staff yeah. really hinders your ability to get a star candidate in the way that like, you know, Mike Kafka would have been, uh, in previous cycles. Um, but yeah, to me, man, like, I, I I don't think you should land on Ken Zampezi. Uh, you think- can't like you can't bring all these people in and again go back to Ken. I think the fans will just go crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um. Personally, like having not met many of these guys personally, I think Pat Shermer kind of falls in that same yeah. category. Uh, I'd like to I'd like to see them try something different, whether it be a, a Charles London, a Thomas Brown, some of those guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. For just let us know. Um, everyone know where they can find you and your content. Yeah. So uh, I'm at Sam S A M the number four T R on Twitter. You can find me in the Washington post at Washington post.com. Uh, my colleague, Nikki Java and I are, are always, you know, trying to figure out what's going on. So we'd appreciate it. Yeah. How was it <laughs> watching, watching um, Patrick Mahomes? Oh yeah, man. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> last week, even on one ankle, I was like, wow, like, I have not seen quarterback play this good in three years. I've been covering this team, man. Like, that dude is different. That yeah, dude is different. that is different. Uh, thank you so much, Sam, for loaning us some of your time. We know it's very precious for you to spend it with us. We truly appreciate it. Um, uh, Thank you. Thank you, buddy. Uh, and thank you, everyone out there, for listening. Thank you for watching. This is Red Zone and the Lab Podcast. I am Deuce. One beat, one sound, one heart. One love. Thank you for listening to Red Zone in the Lab podcast. Please follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at Red Zone in the Lab. And you can download our podcast at Spotify, iTunes, and Podbean. And please visit our website at redzoneinthelab.com. Thank you.